Good morning, everyone. Moment of truth. Had a good day so far? Yes. Ooh. Good. <laughs> good, good. All right, so for the next 30 minutes, I know I'm probably uh, holding you guys off for, for a coffee break. Uh, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about, about uh, governing the power platform from both a partner point of view, so what do you do as a Microsoft partner when you go in and, uh, uh, and you work with your customers, but also from a customer point of view. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on two uh, scenarios, citizen developers as well as then professional developers when, when uh, vendors build solutions. So uh, like the introduction said, my name is Antti. I come from Finland from a company uh, called Forward Forever, and pretty much for the past four years, I've been working pretty much exclusively on Power Platform governance. I come from a Dynamics CRM background, so you know, from from that uh, point of view, the, the, though I'm not technical, I'm functional. Uh, I'm a functional consultant. Uh, the sort of platform and its capabilities are fairly, fairly well known uh, to me. Let's see if this it does work. Now, disclaimers to start with. First off, uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about is based on my experiences working with Finnish enterprise customers. Finnish enterprise customers. And really what enterprise is, is it can be very different if, if it's enterprise in the US or enterprise in, in the UK or enterprise in Finland. So the variables change. And the bigger the company, the bigger the concept of, a, of an enterprise customer, the more complex things will get. And what I also want to emphasize is that, you know, what I'm going to talk about is it's not a silver, silver bullet, but it is something that I have found uh, as an approach that works fairly well, again, for Finnish enterprise when it comes to governing the power platform. And the last disclaimer that I want to make is, you know, if you have been thinking of, of, of governance, whether you're, you know, an, 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 an end customer planning on implementing governance for Power Platform, or if you're a partner planning on offering services to your customers for helping them govern the platform, you know, start from somewhere. You can't really make a mistake. You can start from any angle. The biggest mistake and really the only mistake you can make is not start at all. So start with governance. So first off, you know, what is governance? That's pretty abstract, that's an abstract term. And the way my brain works is I kind of divide governance into these two different buckets. Organizational governance as well as technical governance. Looking at the organizational governance, what that really consists of is people and processes. For someone who is a subject matter expert and a techie, I guess you could say nerd, the organizational governance is the hard part because that's business consulting. So if you, know, if you, someone here is a business consultant and change management and all that stuff, good for you. You're probably gonna ace this. Uh, so this one's hard for me and, and a lot of times what I see with Microsoft partners, this is also hard for them, generalizing of course. Now the other side is technical governance and this is what I primarily am focusing on in the next 26 or so minutes, uh, and this is those technical bits and pieces of the platform. How do we make the platform work uh, from that technical side? So looking at technical governance, what does it really consist of? Now this is not a non-exhaustive list. There is naturally a lot more to it, but kind of on a high level. Technical governance is around architecture security, measuring, monitoring, notifications and requests. So let's kind of dive into these topics. So what is architecture? Well, that's naturally what is being built. Where do we build those things? It's also licensing. Why is it licensing? Well, I love to say that architecture and licensing go hand in hand. Good architecture requires knowledge of licensing. Licensing goes hand in hand with architecture, vice versa. So those are really, really, uh, two important topics when you're planning and governing, planning your solutions uh, and, and planning how to govern the platform. Security is also a big topic. Who gets access? How, what kinds of 
uh, security roles do we use? What kinds of accounts do we use? Do we use uh, service principles? Is our cybersecurity saying that, no, you'll never use service principles. Uh, you can only use service accounts, or again, vice versa. When do cities and developers uh, use you know, their named accounts? All the concepts of, of, of security uh, on the platform. Now, the sort of last two topics of measuring, monitoring, notifications or, and requests kind of branch out to that organizational governance side because there's a lot of processes behind this. Uh, but still, measuring, monitoring, that is core from the you know, technical capability point of view. If our automations fail, what should we do? How do we catch those failures and fix things before our end users reach out to us saying that, hey, something's broken? Notifications as well as requests. How do we, you know, how do we um, understand resource consumption? Where is our platform at? Are we utilizing our licenses? If we have a thousand, you know, a thousand Power Apps licenses, are our users actually using those licenses on the platform when citizen developers are building their solutions? So who knows the technical stuff? What kinds of people are usually behind this? Usually this is the, these are, these are usually the consultants in the Microsoft ecosystem, at the Microsoft partners. Now, a slight pun intended, I think that the best uh, consultants for power platform governance from a technical point of view come from a CRM background. And I know some of you have an, a modern work background and you're frowning, uh, but that's just what I personally witnessed. And the reason for that is a power platform is really based on dynamic CRM. So if you come from CRM, you sort of know the technical bits and pieces. And the office folks, the modern work folks, they have a lot to catch up. So that's why usually CRM people uh, are able to kind of pick up the technical bits and pieces a bit faster when it comes to talking governance uh, with, uh, with customers. So the organizational governance part, though, what is, what is that then? That is stakeholders, responsibilities, business value, and democratization of low code, essentially the same as evangelism. Uh, stakeholders, that's, that's something that we really need the customer for and, and for the customer to really understand how their organization works. That's usually sort of like a black box when we, uh, when we go in and we can only have a limited impact as partners for the stakeholders inside, inside the customer organization. Responsibilities is a big topic. A lot of times we go in uh, to talk governance and to define a governance framework and roles and responsibilities really aren't clear. Who does what? Do we need to hire a new full-time employee? you know, to work on something. Uh, so the roles and responsibilities angle is, is pretty big. And this is some of those, roles and responsibilities is one of those angles that even if you're, you know, if you have a more of a technical background, that is a fairly, I'd say, easy discussion with customers to have. So that's not something you should be uh, afraid for. Now business value, that's then again something where, uh, where we struggle if, customer, if, if customers really have not defined a strategy for their low code platform, which is, you know, that is true. Many enterprise customers are saying, hey, we're, you know, we're investing in Microsoft, we're a Microsoft company, uh, we, we've not defined a strategy for our low code platform at all. So understanding the business value, that is extremely critical so that the platform will actually scale at a customer organization. And then one of the hardest parts of the organizational governance uh, bit is the democratization of low code. So how do you scale uh, at a customer? How do you scale the platform? How do you get new makers? How do you get the platform to explode? How do you make people build? That is one of the biggest wicked problems that I have encountered pretty much at all of our customers. So who knows the, uh, who knows the organizational governance stuff then? Does the customer know this? Well, you'd think. You'd think that the customer would be an expert at this, but a lot of times they're pretty clueless to a lot of these things. A lot of times we work with IT because of the technical angle, and they might not know their internal stakeholders 
pretty much at all. They might not have a clear platform owner. Now, are, is it management consultants? Yeah, it could be management consultants. You could, you know, work with a big five with a with a customer on on these things on the hardest part or on the harder parts. But then, you know, that angle becomes bigger than the framework that you're essentially doing as an MVP of a framework. Is it you? Well, it can definitely be you if you, you know, if you can talk something more than tech, then it can definitely be you. And like I said, some of these angles on organizational governance are a lot easier than, than others. Now, some of the recurring themes that, that uh, I witness at customers is what I want to touch on next. And again, this isn't a, uh, this is a non-exhaustive list and I'm not going to go through all of these. I hope you can read them. They're a bit small. Uh, but still, they are recurring themes at every single, pretty much I could say, every single enterprise customer that I have worked with. And I'm going to talk, to, uh, talk about a couple of these that I want to really uh, emphasize. First off, what seems to be not clear is productivity types. And what I mean by productivity types is how do we categorize what is built on the platform? What is citizen development? What are citizen developers allowed to build? Where do we cross the line where something that John Doe builds becomes too complex and it needs to be you know, taken over by IT or taken over by, by partner? What is shared productivity? You know, if we have business units in 50 countries, and then we have our, our organizational, uh, what I call organizational horizontals, like legal, finance, and so on and so on, how do we categorize solution types and productivity in those kind of organizational areas? What is, what is line of business? What are our line of business applications? So that's one of the uh, early sort of topics that we start discussing to really dissect what are you guys really building? Where were you aiming at with the platform? Who gets to build what where? Who gets to build what where? And that's how we usually lead uh, up with and end up with an environment strategy. Now, uh, some other points are you know, technical debt, for example. As we define a uh, governance strategy, or, or maybe the customer has already done some work on that, there's really no clear plan on how do we resolve technical debt that exists on the platform. Now, a good question is, does, does that technical debt even matter? Sometimes it does, some, sometimes it doesn't, but there's not, a really, there's not really a clear plan to how is that going to be resolved on the platform. There's also very seldom any processes for actually monitoring of the platform. Are we using uh, the correct licenses for, for what you know, has been built by our citizen developers. Well, what is the uh, consumption of, of our apps versus licenses allocated? Are we under or over capacity? How are our uh, API calls doing? And then, special to this conference, I want to highlight that not a single customer that I worked with has had a clear ISV policy in place. What kinds of ISV products are allowed at an enterprise customer. And that's, I think, where you, know, you guys, all of you in Resco, are at a very good point. You have an advantage on this, because you can capitalize on the expertise of Resco and their ISV solutions on securing a safe ISV for enterprise customers. So just some food for thought. But again, not a single customer has ab absolutely had this defined, what ISV solutions are allowed. Now, organizational uh, governance. What are some of the moving parts there? These are a lot of times a lot harder to tackle, like I said, than the uh, technical governance bits and pieces, is they're more abstract. We have a lot more wicked problems here on the organizational governance side than we do on the technical side. Some of these things here that are causing pain are things like idea to from an, from an idea to production. And what I mean by that is when people inside an organization have ideas on, hey, we could build this or this should be built, we need these kinds of things, how do we take those ideas, process them, and then move them forward from an idea stage 
into actually building them and putting them into production. And this is the same whether we're talking about solutions that are built by citizen developers, as in John Doe comes in and says, hey, you know what, I'm gonna build this, or I wanna build this because this is cool to sell to my department, it's gonna save us money, it's gonna save us time, I wanna put it in production, we're gonna have 500 users. Development process and idea to, pro idea to production process for that. And the same with, uh, is, is with vendors. You know, business buys something, IT is clueless what's been bought, if business is allowed to buy, that's always an interesting scenario. Business buys something from a vendor, they end up in a scenario where they have no idea what kinds of licenses should be used because architecture was not planned, was not planned with, together with licensing. Uh, there is no clear understanding of who will actually support and manage that solution. So the, so the partner side or the pro dev side for that idea to production process is also something uh, on the sort of vendor built solution side that is a lot of times lacking. And unfortunately, a low code strategy is not always there. It might be there on some level, but executive commitment and actual KPIs and metrics to what this platform is going to do are just not there a lot of times. So again, recurring themes. So moving on, uh, what's usually on fire? What's what kind of stuff is usually, uh, usually burning? And I want to use an actual example from this May, uh, analyzed a solution that, has been, that was built by citizen developers. And the case there was that, if we kind of look at the first area, what was, what, what's on fire, uh, accounts and contacts were, were, re were reused in the default environment. Everything was, the solution was built in default. Everything was in a, single solution. So this is the architecture side of things. Now if we look at environments, our strategy for, you know, what do we do with environments with the solution? Like I said, it was built in default, there's no ALM, no application lifecycle management. You go to production, you fix your issues there. You find a bug, you fix it in production because it's in default. Now if we look at the security angle, this is the best. Everything was a system admin. Everything, everyone was a system admin. They have uh, 25 or 30 users. It's a multi-billion dollar enterprise company. Uh, no custom security roles. Anyone who's from CRM is, is you know, I'm getting goosebumps. Uh, identity. All components are owned by individual user accounts spread across three, three different makers. The maker is synonymous with citizen developer. Then the licensing side. Only Office 365 e-licenses, even though it's running a model-driven app that requires premium, no technical enforcement. I'm not sure why, probably because they're all system admins so they don't get technically enforced or they're just able to open the app. Uh, yeah, so that's the licensing uh, issue. And finally, <laughs> documentation, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they document anything? Uh, no documentation. Everything is in the heads of those, th those three makers. So, you know, this is something that, that, you know, this sounds really bad, and it actually is really bad. This is one of the worst cases I've seen. But again, generalizing, every single enterprise customer that I work with has something like this. They all have something like this, their version of this. This is why we need, th this is why they need governance. The financial impact, I can't give you the exact uh, figure, uh, have to anonymize this as much as I can. The financial impact, I asked these guys, if I turn off the lights tomorrow because I want to, good job building the app. It's you know, an example of what citizen developers can do. Uh, well, I didn't want to say badly, but that's maybe they picked it up. The financial impact of if you know, the lights get shut down is several million euros. It's in the millions of euros if that, this gets shut down. Because it's not, you know, there, there has to be a strategy for actually moving this somewhere else. But then in the end, you know, multi-billion dollar company with 25 system admins in default who can see all data do anything, see all the other versions, all the other apps that citizen developers have built. Because citizen developer built solutions are in default. Not in, def not in uh, any specific environments because there's no environment strategy. So the governing for, for fire safety essentially is built on these pillars. Architecture, 
really consider what architecture is uh, and how do you do it well. Environments. Environment strategy is a must. It absolutely is a must. Where do you put those things that vendors and, and uh, citizen developers build? Security. How do you make your platform secure? Microsoft says that data at rest, that's fine. That's what I mean, that's not what I mean. How do you actually you know, use the correct security roles uh, and, and correct identities? Identity management, like I just mentioned. Who should own these components? Should they be service account owned, service principal owned? Maybe sometimes the users can use them uh, on the components on their own user accounts. And then licensing. That goes hand in hand with architecture. How do we make sure that current licenses are used uh, that when you know, one of the big fives comes in for an audit, that they don't get in trouble for that? And finally, documentation. We all love that, right? We all love documenting. That's the best, uh, best <coughs> bit of everything. But documentation, it needs to be there. Uh, it is always out of date. That's, I think that's a rule of thumb. Documentation is always out of date. But you need to have a baseline somewhere. You need to have baseline documentation for when another vendor comes in and checks what's been built or citizen developers look at each other's solutions. There needs to be baseline documentation at least on some level. Uh, my personal favorite is putting things in Azure DevOps using you know, DevOps backlogs for your requirements and then essentially having documentation in a DevOps wiki or code-based wiki or whatever that's officially called. I'm not really a DevOps expert. I just uh, I pretend I am. So then, the governance, 30, uh, the governance journey. So how do we actually go towards a governance model now that we've sort of looked at organizational governance, technical governance, we've heard of a horror story, we've uh, identified some of the uh, pillars where the fires are usually burning. How do we actually, you know, establish governance on a journey? And that's what I want to emphasize. It is a journey. So if you have a customer who says, let me buy governance from you. I have a budget for 50,000 euros for this year. Let me buy governance for you. That's not how it works. It's 50,000 euros every single year, year after year after year. It's never ending. It's continuous iteration. It's like it's actually CID, continuous integration, continuous, continuous development, working on a governance framework. What you do is you aim for an MVP, and the point of that is you should aim for an MVP, not you know not to get the moon from the sky, but just aim for an MVP, uh, and that's how you get started. And what I use I like to use is actually uh, Microsoft's concept for uh, Power Platforms, uh, the adoption maturity model. I think that's a good baseline to get started because uh, you can kind of model your customers uh, through the different levels of that model from, uh, from essentially initial level 100 to 500 efficient. So it's a crawl, uh, it's a crawl walk run approach and it makes, mo it makes uh, modeling the actual scenarios with your customers easy. Now the red thread is that get started. Now don't wait. There's nothing better around the corner. Get started from somewhere. There's not a wrong angle. Just get started. But what you also need to understand is you have to define a governance framework before you can actually execute it. If you go to execution, you define a couple of things and then you start executing, you start, correct, you start clearing your technical debt. If you execute right away, you're gonna make mistakes because you have to have these basic building blocks in your governance framework in place first before you can actually take that framework and validate it through execution. So don't, don't clear your technical debt and, and, and you know, play around and, and, and execute things that you think should be corrected, like creating DLP policies before you have everything figured out, before you have an MVP of a framework figured out. Now, what are the steps that I like to take? And again, this is how I do it. You, might, you guys might do it differently. This works for me. This works for us, for Finnish Enterprise. If you have other ideas, we'd actually love to hear them, so feel free to pull my sleeve after uh, my session. But basically, the steps on the journey are 
analyzing the current state. So really figuring out where the customer is on their platform at a given point in time. What's going on? How big of a wild west is it? It's always a wild west, but how bad is it? That's, that's, you know, that's what you do in the first stage. Then what's important is that you try to take your knowledge and shift that to and give that knowledge, your knowledge to the customer. You, you train the customer. So that the customer understands, again, the basic building blocks of how the platform works. And I'm gonna have more on this in a couple of slides. The third thing that I do is I then go in and actually define an MVP, minimum viable product, of a governance framework. And when that definition, when that's ready, then the final stage is to actually execute the framework. So the framework itself is theory. I think this will work. And execution is reality. And then you test your theory, you test your framework against but by executing it, and then you come back and iterate, and then it's continuous iteration. Then you focus on the, uh, uh, on the uh, additional topics. So looking at analyzing the current state, so really the, the, the point of this is to, again, understand the moving parts. It's not an audit, but understand the moving parts is all, in all of the different analysis topics, which are a bit hard to read because they, they're in, uh, in teal or something, or turquoise with, with white, so that's my bad. But the output is really to observe and give recommendations to the customer what they want, like what should be done. You know, if they won't want to work with us after this one, you know, take our recommendations and run with them. Uh, and you know, do the framework yourself if you want to. But to create recommendations, uh, recommendations based on observations. The next step then is to train the customer. And what we do is we train them in Environments, environment strategy, my favorite topic. Everything starts and end, everything starts and ends with environments, environment strategies. Uh, administration in uh, power apps, administration in, uh, in practice, power automate administration in practice, security and, and access management, and licensing and capacity management. So through these, fairly basic, think of level 100, level 200 training, nothing too complex. You can you know, talk this to, IT, you can talk this to business, but transfer your knowledge so that the customer has at least a basic understanding of what the platform is. Because a lot of times, the truth is that IT, they're good at some IT stuff. I'm not always sure what that actually means, what the context of that is. But, but a lot of times, they're not proficient at Power Platform. That's not their number one job. So you kind of, you kind of, you have to help them out and you have to increase their knowledge in Power Platform so that you can deliver value through uh, the framework. And then what you do is you start working on the framework with the customer. You document it somewhere, you have a backlog, uh, like Azure DevOps, or I can't say that name, uh, Azure DevOps, or, or, or something like that. And you base it on different topics. You figure out what are the relevant topics for a framework with your customer and then you work through them in a, in a, in a, a uh, backlog matter. I usually have a pretty fixed set of topics because from a technical, technical point of view, there sort of is a, like, there is a baseline, a bare minimum that needs to be covered in a framework so that all the technical aspects are taken into consideration. And finally, you execute. And after execution, you come back, you revisit the framework, you do it all over again, and, and rinse and repeat. So closing thoughts, there is some time for questions. Uh, so closing thoughts, again, no matter what you do, start, get started, just get started. Plan a couple of topics, get started. You can't really start from a, from a wrong angle. And what, the only wrong thing that you can do is not do anything when it comes to governing the platform. Uh, there is some good materials by Microsoft, like I said, the uh, capability maturity uh, model the, or the adoption maturity model by Microsoft, uh, Power Platform Adoption Framework by Andrew Walsh and, and, and others. And then for those of you who, are, who love methodologies, I do not, but for those of you that love methodologies, it doesn't really matter if you do this in Scrum or Agile or Waterfall or whatever that's up to you. 
know, as long as you have a common way of working with a customer. Uh, so in that sense, you know, this isn't software development. This is you waving your hands with the customer. So methodology is not that important, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. And Ben also says thanks.